All right, welcome everybody to the family report back session about the reopening of schools. Remember that you can also watch on our YouTube channel. Um, we'll be streaming live there. We'll also be streaming live here on Zoom. Um, so if you need translation, please stay here on Zoom. Um, if you do not need translation, um, remember that YouTube is also an option. There's a link on OUSD's Facebook page um, and also on our website, ousd.org. So we'll wait for another couple of minutes for folks to join us. All right, welcome everyone. We're just waiting for folks to join. It looks like we're almost at about 500 participants on Zoom and we have other folks joining us on our YouTube channel. So remember, if you need translation, Zoom is the place to go for you to call in. If you don't need translation, you can join us on our YouTube live stream. Yes, and the chat will be turned on so that we can be collecting um, questions on YouTube as well as Zoom. We will have translation available tonight in Spanish and in Chinese. Um, our Arabic translator won't be here until a little bit later, but as soon as that's available, we will turn it on. And we're just checking on the YouTube live channel. I see that that's, we're waiting for that to get up. So as soon as that is up and running, we'll be able to begin. Okay, we have ASL available tonight. Um, I will make sure that we can get that person added so we can see them. Okay, hi everyone. We're going to get started in another couple of minutes. We still have a number of folks joining us both on Zoom and YouTube. And we're getting our ASL interpretation set up as well. All right, hi everyone. We're going to get started in just a second. Um, as soon as we can get our interpretation set up. We've got plenty of capacity on Zoom. Thanks for those of you who are offering to leave. We've upgraded our account so we can now take 5,000 people. So we're at about 600 right now. And um, Jody, why don't we go ahead and, and move on to the next slide and we'll get our interpretation going. So um, Ava, I will pass it on to you to explain how we can begin translation. Okay, thank you very much. And first of all, I would like uh, to tell our panelists that helps to help us out with interpreting uh, by just speaking at a natural pace and make sure that your volume is correct that way we can hear you very well and we can interpret. Buenas tardes, eh, los intérpretes del de Distrito Escolar, les damos la bienvenida. Es, vamos a estar brindando el servicio de interpretación simultánea, pero usted necesita activarla y yo le voy a decir cómo. Todavía no está activado, entonces cuando se active usted lo va a ver. Vaya a los controles en la parte inferior de la pantalla y busque el icono de interpretación. Es un icono que tiene un globo terráqueo. 
Cuando pulse en él se va a desplegar una lista con idiomas, seleccione el idioma español. Usted, una vez que haya hecho esto, deberá escuchar al intérprete alto y claro y quizá en el fondo escuche un poquito el inglés. Pero si oye los dos idiomas en el mismo volumen, por favor, desconéctese de la junta y vuelva a ingresar para que se restablezcan los parámetros. Si tiene algún problema, contáctenos por el chat. Nosotros vamos a estarlo monitoreando todo el tiempo. Eh, para hacer comentarios públicos, participe como lo estarán haciendo todo el resto de la gente, levantando su mano. Nosotros vamos a estar a la mano para interpretar. Y también, si desea hacerlo por el chat, por favor, escriba sus comentarios en español. También los vamos a traducir. Uh, and again, uh, you see the instructions in English, but English speaking people you do not need to do anything okay thank you very much and david if you could um explain the interpretation uh instructions in chinese please okay Chinese Great, thank you. Um, and so we're going to work on getting our ASL interpreter visible as well. Um, and so just know that if you need to watch it on um, YouTube, the live streaming is working. There's a slight delay, but it is online. Um, and in here, please put your questions in the Q&A section so that our staff can answer those questions. Um, and in um, YouTube, the chat is live, so feel free to go ahead and put your questions there. And we have staff monitoring as well. The way that we have this evening structured is that our presenters will pause at the end of each section and staff will lift up some of the themes that are coming up um, in the Q&A from Zoom, um, as well as from the chat on YouTube. So we'll be pausing to address some of those themes and some of those questions that are coming up on both of those platforms. All right, and let's go ahead and um, get started with our outline for the meeting. And I just want to pause and make sure that interpretation is working. It sounds like we All right, I want to check with our participants who need translation to let us know if translation is working. I don't think it's working. Okay. I don't see the icon. Okay. Okay, so we're just double checking to make sure that we can get translation working, um, which includes ASL, Spanish, and Chinese. Our Arabic translator is not on the line yet, and so as soon as he joins, we will make the Arabic translation available as well.
All right, for those of you who are just joining us, we're getting translation set up in Spanish, in Chinese, and in ASL. As soon as that's set up, we'll go ahead and get started with the outline of the meeting. Okay, so while we get um, the translation set up, uh, I want to make sure that we have the correct YouTube link. I'm going to ask one of our panelists to go ahead and put that in the chat in Zoom for all of the attendees so that they can see the latest link. Um, and then I will get us started on the agenda for tonight. So we're going to begin with some remarks from our superintendent um, and then hear from our chief academic officer as well as our chief systems and services offer, officer about the instructional model for the year and what we're doing to prepare for the opening weeks of school, um, as well as an update from the um, state in uh, Assembly Bill 77 and Senate Bill 98 of what's required of districts. We'll also be providing some updates about technology distribution, meal service, and um, registration. And then we'll get into some more details of when we are able to offer some in-person in instruction, um, what are some of the safety guidelines that we'll be following. Um, we'll hear from an update from one of the doctors that we are working with from UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. Um, talking about the different phases of what blended learning could look like, um, as well as providing some updates about our ordering of PPE, our safety product protocols, and our progress to date. Um, and then we have a lot of information here. We're going to be trying to go quickly so we can get through all of it. This deck will be made available to you um, towards the end, so don't worry if you don't catch all the details the first round through. Um, and also just to be aware, we are in negotiations right now to land on new MOUs with all of our um, labor partners. So we will be clear about what things are for certain and what things are um, pending negotiations once those are finalized. So to go ahead and begin, I'm going to introduce um, our superintendent, Dr. Kyla johnson Tremel, and she will kick us off. Kyla? Excuse me, I was muted. Thank you, Salja, and good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. And I do hope that you and your family is remaining um, safe during everything that we're going through. Um, I will be brief because we do have a lot of information and we wanna give everyone the opportunity to be able to share um, their thoughts and their questions in the chat, as has been stated before. Um, staff will do their absolute best to answer as many questions um, as they can during our time together. Um, so one of the things that I just want to um, underscore um, as, as a, a message for our entire presentation um, is that really the recommendations, and I'm specifically using the word recommendations um, for two reasons. One, we are in the middle of labor negotiations. And so this is um, our recommendations for fall opening, um, but we are going through those discussions with our labor partners. Um, but two, the fact that what we are currently um, experiencing is uncertain. Um, and so as conditions change, we have to continue to pivot. I mean, as I've said many times, where we are now, we absolutely have to continue um, to be adaptive leaders um, and to ensure um, that our plans and our proposals are nimble um, and that we can shift because that's one thing that we're seeing for sure um, is that we will continue to live in quite a bit of uncertainty for this school year. Um, so what you're seeing in the recommendation one is a result of we had about 105 stakeholders um, across the district that helped to develop recommendations. Those recommendations were then informed by many of the surveys um, from parents and from employees. 
And so what we have tried to do is strike the balance of concerns um, and desires and recommendations from both the parent community um, that you can imagine is very diverse in terms of wants and needs, as well as staff, staff concerns and staff wants and needs. I will say the common denominator is there hasn't been a teacher, a staff member, um, and obviously a parent who isn't anxious to come back to school. Um, the big tension, as we know, is safety and both wrestling with uh, the social and the psychological safety of our students the longer they're out of school with the real concerns that everyone has um, for various reasons in terms of physical safety. Uh, and so what you will see is recommend or our recommendations that are striking the balance between the two. Um, we are recommending that we start the year um, in distance for up to four weeks. Uh, my chief academic officer will talk a little bit about the details of that, but I do want to underscore throughout the presentation um, that we're using the word recommendation because we are in the middle of um, labor negotiation. Um, and I want everyone to get comfortable with not um, us not actually using word final uh, certainty, because even when we get to the point where we have agreement, um, we know as soon as the ground shifts in terms of our overall environment and conditions, we are going to have to adopt again. Um, and we're going to have to continue to adopt new plans and adapt um, how it is that we're going to do school for this year. Um, so I want to just again, I want to appreciate all, all the stakeholders and parents who have helped us get to the point that we have this far. Um, and I want to urge you um, to please put your questions in the chat, even if we cannot answer them tonight. Um, we do, I do look through all of the questions, um, all of the concerns, and we will absolutely um, use those to move planning forward. So with that, I will turn it over um, to Janine, who's going to provide a brief labor update, and then we will get into the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Superintendent. Um, next slide. So we are in labor negotiations at this time, and I wanna just start with a special thanks to all of our labor partners. This is definitely not traditional negotiations. Um, we are in unprecedented times to say the least. So all of our labor partners, um, each labor group asked me, SEIU, CSEA, UAOS, OEA, um, Teamsters, BCTC, rolled up their sleeves and appointed members to the action teams that have, was referred to previously. So I just wanna send a special thank you to them for doing that, although this is untraditional and uh, very unprecedented. And then secondly, I just wanted to add that we are in negotiations with uh, both AFSCME and OEA. Uh, we've started with AFSCME who represents our custodial services as well as uh, many of our special education uh, paraeducators, health services, uh, LVNs and 504 techs. And that is because safety is a priority and also we are putting an emphasis on providing services to our most vulnerable students and that does include students with medical conditions, students with um, in special education. So we've began the process of negotiating with AFSCME around uh, those classifications. And secondly, uh, we are in negotiations with OEA. And I wanted to, in addition to thanking labor partners, also thank you as community members for responding and to surveys that we've put out to let us know what kind of worked last year, what families really need, if we are to uh, have distance learning in the fall. And so those recommendations and responses to surveys, as well as the recommendations from our action teams, have informed our, our initial proposals with OEA at the table. And so we have, um, we've negotiated with them today. They have a great team. We have a dynamic team at the table. We're proposing to start in distance. I think we're all in agreement that whether it's now 
now, whether it's later, there's always that possibility that we would be falling back to a distance model. All right, while we wait for Janine to get back on, let's go ahead and um, move. And I wanna echo what Janine was saying, which is that all of our labor partners have really leaned in on this planning process in order to create the recommendations and plans that you're gonna see um, tonight. So Jody, could we go, go ahead and go to the next slide, please? Um, and so I'm gonna be um, introducing um, some of the work that we'll uh, be sharing with you tonight around our recommendations for next year. And um, my name is Salaja Suresh. I am a senior director in the district and coordinated the action team of 105 members who were teachers um, and principals and parents and central office leaders to come forward with recommendations on um, what school should look like next year. And we'll be sharing some of those recommendations as well as some of the final decisions that we've made. Um, and just know that we are, as Jenny mentioned, still in negotiations. And so there are a lot of decisions that have yet to be determined in partnership with our um, labor unions. And so um, what I want to start with is um, some of the most important information that has really um, helped guide our recommendations. And so Jody, you want to go to the next slide, which is um, feedback from our community. Um, so over the course of the last two months, We've put out a number of surveys. We've had an open thought exchange. We've had many meetings um, that were held at, by individual school communities, as well as with um, the wider OUSD um, family and um, have, have a lot of really clear themes that have come out um, that are, have guided our recommendations for this year. So really top of mind for a lot of people is around access to technology. We're gonna be talking about that tonight of what the plan is around distributing devices, making sure that families have access, um, about making sure that there is improved communication from the district as well as from schools around how families can support their children with success with distance learning, um, to make sure that we're attending to students mental health and socio-emotional needs, um, and that there's more time for online instruction. As everyone knows, we had to pivot very quickly to online learning in the spring. We learned a lot from that experience. Um, and now how do we make sure that students have access to more than just um, a half an hour, one hour, or um, a short period of time each day? And the new state guidelines are really going to um, shape how we provide online instruction um, over the course of this year. And in particular, how are we making sure that students who need that additional support in order to access distance learning, distance learning is getting that. Um, some of the themes that we're seeing in a lot of the in-person meetings that we've been holding or on Zoom um, are thinking about when we do return to in-person learning, how do we make sure that it's safe that um, we can actually do what we are planning on, that we can afford it, um, and that it is enough. Um, so one of the things that you'll be hearing about tonight are the team of doctors that we've been consulting with um, who have been critical partners in us really making sure that our safety measures um, reflect the latest science and the latest uh, safety guidance. Um, and to make sure that, that we are providing an option for students as well as teachers who need to remain in distance only learning and that we um, are ensuring that there is some level of consistency and accountability throughout the district so that parents, no matter which school their child attends, um, are receiving um, the same kind of level of support and service um, when we are in distance learning. And to make sure, again, that we're tending to those socio-emotional needs and really around relationship building, um, you know, that we especially in the in distance learning and we don't have the ability to build those relationships in person, um, that we are really figuring out how do we do that? And how do we build relationships with our newest students um, as well as students who um, can't really engage in the same way with distance learning and that those relationships are strong to build academically upon that. Um, and then with that, as the sort of main themes that we're hearing in a number of these feedback sessions, um, I want to pass uh, the presentation over to Dr. Sandra Aguilera, who's our Chief Academic Officer, to go over the instructional model for this year. Thank you, Sasha. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sandra Aguilera. I'm the Chief Academic Officer for our district. I'll take you through the instructional models for elementary and um, secondary schools. 
Um, I first just want to start by saying a huge thank you to the action team. The action team um, that Salsha was leading um, was a uh, hundred people large, and uh, they were uh, teachers, parents, um, central office staff, department leads, um, custodians, so various people in our district that uh, really want to provide their guidance as to how we should be thinking about the fall. Uh, and with that, um, I will take you through the instructional model, uh, which was uh, you know, developed by a smaller subset of that group. Um, and I really just want to highlight that um, they used uh, the safety guidance and the science guidance um, that um, has been out there in our educational community to make up these models. And not only did they look at that guidance, they went and asked um, principals what they thought of those plans, asked teachers what they thought of those plans, and then came back and refined based on the feedback um, that they were uh, receiving. We also did take these um, models to different um, family and community forums uh, where we also collected a lot of information. Uh, so this just was not um, you know, created by only a central office. It was uh, created by a team. Uh, so with that, I um, would like to um, walk us through those plans. Sandra, could you speak a little bit closer to your mic where I, it's a little bit muffled. We're getting some requests for you to speak louder. Okay, let me see. Is that, is that better? Yes, thank you. I can make sure to yell a little bit louder. Okay. So our base instructional model is distance learning. And that um, is because we are um, not always sure if we can provide in-person learning. Uh, we do have um, a way to measure the phases that we would like to implement. Um, but because we may um, go back and forth into distance learning and into what is called blended learning, which is a combination of um, internet learning plus in-person instruction. Uh, we do want to make sure that our distance learning is strong. Uh, we did receive feedback from the surveys that our families did uh, to say that they, they gave us you know, direct um, feedback on what would make distance learning better. Uh, the biggest piece is having opportunities for students to learn not only in whole group um, class sessions, but also in small groups. Uh, so when you see the plans roll out from your um, particular school, you will see that um, we've paid attention to that feedback. Um, so we also want to stress, and this question has come up a lot um, in our community sessions, if students that uh, or families that do not wish to participate um, in in-person learning, if they would have a distance learning option all year long, and the answer is yes, they will have that option. Um, so wanting to um, stress the distance learning is our base instructional model. Um, with that, you'll also see that the group has created three phases, and they're the blended learning phases. And um, what you'll see is a difference in those phases is that uh, we have groups of students that will come back. And with those groups of students, we're focusing on students that need the most support. And that doesn't mean that other students won't receive any support. It's just that the in-person sessions um, will focus on students that we are seeing through assessments and through parent feedback that they need more support, um, that distance learning is not as beneficial to them. Um, so for safety, um, we've looked at six key safety factors. Later on in the presentation, we'll be going through uh, what that means. Um, also for equity, uh, we are looking at uh, what our students need. Um, so you'll see specific groups of students called out as examples in the models that we will go through. Every four to six weeks, we will be looking at how we're doing in each of the phases to determine if we can move into the next phase. If we are not ready to move into the next phase, we will not be moving forward into that next phase. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, this question has... I'm sorry, can I interrupt you for a second? I know that some people are struggling with the uh, interpretation right now. We're gonna ask our interpreters to go ahead and um, put in some of the summaries in the chat if the audio isn't working. Okay, thank you. Sorry, go ahead, Sandra. Okay, okay. 
So um, then we move into our strong start plan. And um, I do wanna keep stressing that these are plans. These are recommendations that we're making to start off the year that we are still in negotiations with our labor partners. Um, so we are um, planning to open August 10th. Um, we are planning for distance learning to last up to four weeks. Um, so that way um, we have a chance to start strong and I'll take you through what that uh, strong start plan looks like. And we are saying we're doing a phased in approach uh, to in-person learning. Uh, so the families can plan on at least the first four weeks of um, instruction to be in distance learning. So the strong start plan um, is a uh, plan that will be individual to school sites, but that doesn't mean school sites will be making up their own plans um, that don't fall in line with some new legislation that I will take us through. The strong start plan at each school site for students is meant to call out specifically how um, outreach and connection will happen um, between the school site, teachers, staff, and students. Uh, there will be opportunities to distribute learning packets, textbooks, uh, technology, and um, there will be a focus on orientation to how to do online learning, and we will start um, assessments. Uh, so that way we know how students are doing. For staff, um, the focus, and that's again the first four weeks, is um, meant to be support and preparation. So staff have opportunities to look at assessments, look at the scope and sequence for instruction. We have district-wide scope and sequence documents uh, that we provide our teachers. However, due to um, our current context, we need to adjust that scope and sequence. And so um, there will be an opportunity for teachers um, and you know, staff to go through those more deeply. And there will be um, also an orientation with stakeholders between our staff and um, families. Uh, so that way everyone is on the same page in terms of the path forward. Next slide, please. Okay, so I referenced this new legislation. It is called AB 77. And from that, our district is required to do a few um, key essential things. We are required to create a learning continuity and attendance plan. And that plan um, is a, would be available for comment to the public through different stakeholder groups. Uh, and that plan um, describes very specific items like instructional minutes and days. Um, in terms of the instructional minutes, uh, there is a reduction by grade level. Um, so each year a, a school needs to submit their uh, master schedule or um, how many uh, minutes a day a student is learning. Um, and the guidance um, has been reduced. Um, kindergarten is nearly the same. Secondary is reduced significantly. There's online and in-person instruction minutes that are acceptable. So that means that in order to meet the instructional minutes, the state has said you can do a combination of in-person and online instruction to meet those requirements. There's also a range required um, in terms of three to four hours uh, per day. Uh, so that gives you a sense of how many hours a day um, our students will be in class. Uh, instructional days is still 180 days. There needs to be some form of contact um, with every day for those 180 days. Next are the required supports. So during distance learning, um, our district must provide technology and internet access. There also needs to be grade level content. We still must teach the standards. Uh, I really want to pause here for special education. Uh, there have been a lot of questions about how we would provide special education services. We are required to implement IEP, um, the individual education plans. Um, those are the plans that, that the team of parents and teachers have agreed upon. So for those plans, uh, we are required to implement those services. The language is still as best as possible in a distance learning setting. 
so we do have um, you know, continued plans to do both online and um, in-person, both instruction and assessments, because uh, we do need to uh, go back to doing assessments. It's really difficult to do assessments uh, online. You basically can't. Uh, so we have to do some sort of in-person um, interaction so that way we can uh, continue those assessments. Uh, we will have opportunities specifically for our um, community advisory council uh, or committee uh, to see those specific special education plans because we have made special or specific plans for our special education staff. Our English language supports are also called out in this, um, just in this uh, continuity and attendance plan. Uh, we must still provide what is called designated and integrated um, language development. Uh, so that means that um, teachers must still um, teach our English language learners um, in an integrated fashion, which is language through the content, and then designated, which is the um, how to how to speak English and how to read English, how to write English uh, in a more direct way. And we do have specific guidance for teachers of language learners. So that way they have support on how to adjust their instruction uh, to best teach our English language learners. So mm -hmm. all of what has been... I just want to pause and give the interpreters time to catch up. Because I saw I the interpretation flow yeah, come up. Exactly. So um, Jody, if you could go to the previous slide just so that we can pause and make sure that interpretation um, is all caught up. And so we will give our interpreters a few seconds here, and then we'll pick up where Dr. Aguilera left off on the next slide. So again, if you're looking for interpretation, it's on Zoom, and you can click on the globe button um, to log on for Spanish and Chinese. And I believe we're still waiting for our Arabic translator to log on right now. You want for me to wait a moment, yes? Okay. Okay, great. Jody, let's go ahead and go back. Thank you so much, Sandra. Go ahead. Okay, so um, in terms of the next bullet, which is daily interaction with staff and peers, um, as I mentioned before, um, there must be contact with students on a daily basis. Um, it is that that does not mean it has to only be by um, the teacher. Uh, other staff may have contact um, with uh, students, uh, but the, our students need to be in some sort of interaction with the staff and with their peers on a daily basis. Uh, we will be taking a modified attendance. Um, this past spring, we had um, a manual way of doing that that didn't really work that well. Uh, because it was very labor intensive. We will be going back to using our um, student system called ARIES to track a daily participation and attendance. Um, the learning continuity and attendance plan also includes tiered supports. So it breaks down for us how we should be addressing um, when students are not moving forward academically and also um, if a student is absent more than three days. Uh, there are specific um, strategies that we are uh, going to include in our plan. Uh, we will collect your feedback on that plan um, prior to approving that plan in September. Uh, there is a, a state deadline of September uh, 15th for doing, September 30th, sorry, for completing that um, item. Um, and I take you through that legislation because it's important for you to know that we will have a district-wide plan. And from that, school sites will need to think about how to implement the specific details that we have written into uh, the district-wide plan in their setting. It doesn't mean that it will be completely different, but they do have to do some adjusting because um, every school um, is a bit different in terms of their structures and their systems but there will definitely be some commonalities and that's why we've um, raised these with you. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna take you through elementary and secondary um, specifically. So um, the design for elementary distance learning is that students um, have weekly outcomes um, that 
they will be um, supported to reach. So the students and the families will know on a weekly basis what they are um, supposed to be learning. I mentioned before, we are modifying the scope and sequence using our um, curriculum and also the integration, and this is new, of learning platforms. Um, we have taken the feedback and uh, from families to know, okay, um, it felt a little choppy. How can this um, design for instruction be seamless between the curriculum and the platforms? Um, and so we will have specific time with our teachers, our support staff, and our principals uh, to take them through these different um, scopes and sequences by grade level. So that way there is um, some coherence about the instructional model. Uh, lead teachers right now are helping to create the content. Um, also, teachers will be asked to provide not only whole group instruction, but small group instruction. There is also an opportunity to use um, the outdoor as a outdoors as a learning space. Uh, so there are modifications that you'll see on campuses uh, to help support implementing more outdoor learning as compared to being indoors all the time. In terms of content, we are focusing on daily foundation foundational literacy, daily reading, writing, and discussion. I mentioned English language development uh, that includes integrated and designated ELD, uh, daily math lessons, and then uh, on a weekly basis, providing social studies and science. We cannot forget about um, social studies and science in the instructional plan. There will also be community meetings to start off the days. So that way um, students have that social emotional learning and support. And then um, there will be access to PE, music and art as usual. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we'll go through the secondary model. And this is a difference um, than what uh, students normally um, have experienced. It is a nine week, we're calling them mini masters, uh, but for families, you may have also heard of this as like quarters, um, but in our system, we're calling it mini masters and this is what the team designed. Uh, so what you'll notice is a breakdown of the possible classes that students could be taking. Um, so what you'll notice is fewer classes um, the first nine weeks. It's meant to be nine weeks with three classes um, plus electives. Sorry, that does include electives. Uh, nine weeks in um, the next set of curricula and that would compose the fall semester. Um, and then in the spring, you would do another set of classes for nine weeks um, and then rotate onto the last set uh, for nine weeks. It is meant to provide an opportunity for teachers to team teach. Uh, so if your um, child is in, in secondary, that's both um, six through eight and nine through 12, they could experience less classes for shorter periods of time. Uh, but that doesn't mean overall they're getting less time in that particular content area. There um, is also the possibility, and again, these are proposed um, uh, way of learning. There is also the possibility of teachers having less student contact. Uh, right now, there's about 150 contacts um, you know, in the contract, and this would provide um, teachers an opportunity to have less contacts um, and focus in more on with, with their students. And there's an opportunity for team teaching. So when um, the English teacher is teaching, the physical education teacher is helping with more of the wellness um, checks with students. Next slide, please. So I wanted to leave you with a glimpse as to what is already started. Um, so what you'll see is a lot of work that is in motion. There are a few key dates. Um, July 27th is when our principals come back to work um, officially. And um, we have a series of learning that um, we uh, take them through. So all of the plans that I have mentioned will be ready by the 27th because they need to be ready for um, principals and their teams to digest and get ready for um, you know, in, involving more teachers in that planning the week of August, starting August 5th. Uh, so those are big key dates that um, everyone should know about. 
Uh, this, these are the normal ways that we bring our staff back. We will have opportunities um, for more uh, learning prior to that to get our um, staff ready uh, to implement these plans. So there's the scope and sequence. Um, the assessment team has already recommended assessments and will um, be taking leadership and uh, teachers through what that looks like to collect their feedback. Uh, there's also, uh, I described the engagement um, strategies and the process for tracking um, student engagement. We have to have a real focus on, on this um, going into the, the fall. Uh, we'll also be able to explain um, how we're intervening and targeting um, certain students that need more support in the academic program. Uh, we also have a new uh, social emotional learning guide that we'll be taking our uh, school leadership teams through. Uh, it is really comprehensive. It is from an organization called CASEL, and we are a partner with them, uh, so we have access to um, their guidance. With that, uh, I will turn it uh, over to Preston, who will take us through technology information. At a later um, phase, uh, or a later in the slides, I'll take us through uh, more of the phases and how we'll be phasing in in-person learning. All right, thank you, Sandra. Um, so I'm gonna launch into, um, you know, with our Strong Start plan, technology is gonna be a critical component of that. And we're very fortunate in Oakland um, to have a community campaign that was an amazing success, a partnership between the mayor's office, OUSD, Tech Exchange, and the Ed Fund. Um, I believe we reached our fundraising goal in just a few days and immediately went into action to try to get the devices. Um, you know, it's a testament to the deep level of support in our community to make sure that kids get access to um, the, the tools that they'll need to engage in distance learning. So a couple of things like on this slide that are just really critical. One is that this is a need-based program and families must fill out the tech survey and they're building that tech survey right now it'll go online on August the 3rd. And so that determines based the, need, the tech needs that people are having at home and also which individuals qualify. Um, right now in Oakland, um, at the, we left out about 18,000 student devices um, and they're still out there. And so we've also purchased new computers that we will be checking out to some students on a loan basis if the Oakland Undivided campaign devices aren't, haven't arrived in time. And so, and in those, and, and in situations where students don't have devices, you can imagine in, in early elementary that there will be packets that will go home for students and families um, while, while they're waiting for the devices to arrive. Um, we expect to be distributing the Oakland Undivided slide, uh, excuse me, the, um, um, devices in the third week of August. Um, what's been on order for OUSD is about 19,000 Chromebooks that will go home and be delivered and be the, the students actual Chromebooks. Uh, and also there's going to be internet connectivity devices for about 15,000 or more families in OUSD. Can you go to the next slide please? So I think that this is a really a critical slide that kind of is gonna, you know, I'm gonna walk you through the process. And it, and it all starts with that technology survey on um, the August the 3rd, is it's, you know, our solution for every home is to have a computer that is based on like a survey of family needs. And then we also are checking families to make sure that they have access to the internet. And then there is ongoing tech support for both families and students to get connected. So. On August 3rd, they'll complete the technology survey. Um, that survey will then qualify you based on your home technology needs or and your socioeconomic status. Um, families will then be approved for particular devices and we're still working out the distribution, but it will either be home delivery or it will be at the school site. And then um, students will actually receive that Chromebook and begin instruction. And then there'll be ongoing technology support for families. So more to come on that, um, but definitely, you know, mark the date August the 3rd um, in terms of the tech survey and then also that for, for the beginning of school, which starts on August the 10th. Um, next slide, please. All right. So one of the, the, the you know, 
big investments Oakland has made is into ensuring that our food service continued through the summer. Um, to date, we have served approximately 3.4 million meals um, you know, for our district when a lot of districts across the entire um, you know, an entire state shut down their meal service. We continue to offer um, food throughout and will continue through the summer. Um, so as we, as we um, begin in distance learning for the beginning of the school year, we'll remain in this form of um, meal distribution where we have the 24 sites across um, the district that will be offering food for families. Any family can come in and pick up that food. Once we move to in-person instruction, we will start to structure the food distribution so that it aligns to that model. So for example, um, if students come in person two days a week, that essentially they would get food at the breakfast and lunch at the school site. Um, then on the third day, when they leave on that second day, they would end up taking lunches for the next three days. And that is breakfast, lunches, and suppers. So we we are we'll build like kind of a hybrid model as we move into the blended learning. But we have a deep commitment to continue meal service um, for the city of Oakland. And so um, the next slide, please. So a quick line around a registration. I saw it in the chat a little bit earlier. There's really a registrations open now. Um, we encourage families to complete registration before the first day of school, which is August the 10th. Um, there are two different um, ways that you can, can register. One, there's an online um, strategy that you can use to register. And then school sites will be reaching out to um, students that have been assigned to particular schools, and they'll begin their registration process for on-site. Some of those schools, I think one of, one of the big questions is like, what if I don't have access to technology um, to be able to fill out that survey? School sites will have an opportunity for you to fill out um, those that, that online technology survey as part of the on-site registration at the school site. So I think that's it for now. That was a lot of information, but uh, we'll, I think we're gonna turn it over to a, some questions at this point. Great, so I will give our staff members a chance to go ahead and um, summarize some of the themes that they're seeing in the chat, both on our YouTube live stream, as well as here in the chat on Zoom. Um, and I can address some of those questions and um, pass them off to Sandra and Preston as well. Um, definitely hearing um, a lot of questions come up around a lot of the announcements that are happening in other districts that are also announcing that they are starting in distance learning. Um, those announcements don't have a direct relationship to what OUSD decides to do. I think every community is really trying to respond to the situation in their particular context. Um, but it, it is interesting to, to see the trends as they are um, emerging across the country. Um, other questions that are coming up are around the technology distribution. Um, one thing to just be mindful of is, you know, we are ordering 19,000 devices. So is San Francisco, so is West Contra Costa, so is Los Angeles. Um, every district all over the world is, is trying to meet this new era in um, ordering devices and getting their families set up. So, um, you know, the, the supply chain um, for technology as well as everything else um, is, is generally delayed around the world. And so we're doing what we can. We started ordering all the way back in April um, so that we can be ready for the, the start of the school year. But um, there are thousands of devices that we have to make sure that we get tracked and into students' hands in time. Um, uh, some other questions that are coming up are around grading and attendance. We'll have that information available in time for school, um, but just know that the plan is to be providing grades to students this year, um, as well as taking attendance, both for online, um, as well as in-person instruction when we're able to do that. Um, and that is also a requirement from the state is that we do track attendance um, and do re-engage students who are not um, joining us in the distance learning environment. Um, and because we began planning relatively early in Oakland, we began planning back in May, um, the state's guidance didn't actually come out until the end of June. Um, and we're here now two weeks later, 
trying to make sense of it and trying to build our systems to meet the state guidance. Um, and this is definitely a situation that um, all of the districts are in, as well as all of the software companies, um, as they have to rebuild their software um, to meet the new state requirements that it, we can't just use the same old systems in the same old ways, um, that we really have to adapt to the way that we use them to meet the new requirements um, that have never existed before. Um, and so just as a reminder, um, a few things. One, we will make this video available online um, as well as the deck for anyone who missed earlier portions of the presentation. Um, we will also be um, providing this um, translated for those of you who weren't able to access translation in the beginning. Um, and uh, with that, I wanna make sure that we continue on so we stay on time. So Jody, could you take us to the next slide, please? Great. So um, we talked a little bit about what distance learning could look like for the first four weeks of the year and some of the things that we are preparing for. At the same time, we are preparing for um, bringing students back. We know that this is something that a number of our families want. We have heard over and over again that this is something that they need and that's something that their students also need. Um, and so we are preparing for this distance start to the year, um, but we're also trying to prepare for when it is safe to bring students back. Um, what does that look like? And a reminder for those of you who missed the update at the beginning, we are in negotiations with our labor partners right now. Um, and a lot of decisions will be pending the result of those negotiations. And so what I'm talking about here is how we are preparing um, for when we do reach those agreements, for when we are able to bring some students back for some in-person instruction. Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, again, distance learning is our base model. We know that all of our students over the course of the year will have distance learning as an element of their instructional program um, to start the year. That will be the core instructional program for all of our students. And we've learned a lot from what happened in the spring by listening to students, by listening to families, by listening to teachers, um, and are trying to address those um, areas of improvement for the fall. When we do begin in-person instruction, the goal is to um, begin it in phases where we are bringing some students back um, in each phase while we're widening access over the course of the year. And we're doing that to make sure that our safety protocols can be followed um, and that we are able to actually bring students back safely um, and not just open the doors and have everyone back at the same time. And really our highest priority here um, is the, the safety of our students and our staff. Um, that we are already beginning to order PPE, that we're already beginning to develop protocols and print signs, that we're really doing our best to prepare for this um, as soon as is possible. Um, and we're committing to communicate with our families and to make sure that students and parents and family members, as well as our staff members, are getting updates from us about the ways in which we are preparing to bring students back when we are able to do that. Um, next slide, please. So this is some of the information that we've been getting back from families in some of the surveys that we have put out. Um, when we look at uh, the numbers across the different language of surveys that we are putting out there, um, we do see that there are a majority of families who have participated in the English survey um, who do want to return to some form of in-person instruction. Um, but a solid almost quarter um, are not willing to bring their children back to some form of in-person learning, which is why we are offering the option to all families to stay in distance learning if that is what they choose for their family. And then a number of other families, about 15% or so, who are not really sure which way they're gonna go. Um, and if we look at our Spanish speaking families, about, just about under half um, who are reluctant to send their children back to in-person learning right now. Again, about a quarter who are, have decided that they will not be sending their child back to school in person. Um, and then the respondents to our Chinese language survey where it is almost half who are in the no category of being um, unwilling or um, not desiring right now uh, to send their children back to in-person learning. And when we dug a little bit deeper with those families to say, well, what is your reason why um, you might be reluctant to begin in-person learning? Um, there are a few factors who rose to the top. 
Um, one was just obviously safety concerns of, I don't think that the safety measures that will be in place around masks and around social distancing um, are sufficient. Um, and others are worried about students who might be at risk or other family members who might be at risk. Um, and those are things that we obviously don't have control about and so want to make sure that we are supporting those families and staying in distance learning if that is what is best for them and for their children. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. And so this is, um, again, some information from families about what kind of schedule should we be able to go to blended learning? What kind of schedule would work for them and work for their family? Um, and as you can see, the, the results are kind of all over the spectrum where um, there is a majority um, of families who are supporting, you know, all day three or four days or all day one or two days a week that those are strongly favorable those green and purple lines indicate that they're um, in favor of this particular plan um, and then you can see over towards the right um, that there is uh, the option of you know half days just one or two days a week which in the blue line indicates doesn't really work for our family. Um, it is a burden for working parents to try and um, navigate that particular schedule that is, that is very shortened. Um, and so this was useful information for us in thinking about how to design a blended model where we're able to have students back for at least a few days a week um, for uh, a, a, an extended period of time. Um, and again, we can't um, say exactly what those schedules might be because we have to make sure that we finalize our contracts with our unions before we're able to do that. Um, but as Dr. Aguilera, our chief academic officer mentioned earlier in the meeting, the state does have new instructional minutes requirements for all school districts, which starts at kindergarten, which is three hours a day, and goes up to secondary all the way up to 12th grade where it's about four hours a day. And so those are the new daily instructional minutes um, that districts are asked to abide by. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. And so here I want to go ahead and pass it back to Preston Thomas, who's our chief systems and services officer. And he can talk a little bit about um, what are the county guidelines around school reopening of the safety protocols that we're expected to follow. Thank you, Salja. Um, as you can see on the slide, and I won't go through it in detail, but um, the, the county, state, and federal guidance has changed repeatedly um, throughout this process as we learn. I mean, it's a natural process of learning. What we do know today is that face uh, cloth face, face coverings will be for all students. Face shields are going to be an added level of protection for staff, and we'll talk about what we have available um, currently. Um, we, we need to partner with parents. We need multiple screenings. We need screenings before kids ultimately come to school and also at school. Um, we're gonna maintain the physical distancing and really the key thing around the epidemiologist, uh, epidemiology of this is to keep kids in small groups, stable groups that don't change very often. So they get to interact with a smaller group of students. Um, and it is okay for teachers to, um, to work with multiple cohorts at a time. Um, and then there's other precautions that we, we will be putting into place. Um, can you move to the next slide, please? So this is a slide that many of you have seen um, before. And I just wanna say that like, you know, as a former science teacher, um, my son, I started him off on a project where he was like tracking the number of cases in Oakland and around the state and, you know, when we went exactly four months ago, when we went into distance learning for the district, um, there were zero cases in Oakland. And now we can see in this chart that there's tremendous numbers of cases of COVID-19. And this chart is cumulative. So it shows you from the beginning of, um, from, uh, of the epidemic to where we are today. Um, and I just, keep bringing this up because really the most critical thing for us as a, as, as a community is to continue to practice social distancing, to continue to wear masks, make sure that we're supporting each other. At the beginning of this, when we started food distribution, um, most of the people that were working in food distribution, none of them knew anybody that had COVID-19. Now everybody knows somebody that has been infected with the coronavirus and you know, that, that is our, our new reality. And so one of the things that it just 
want to co constantly remind folks and, and for everybody on this call to continue to remind people to wear their masks and um, continue the social distancing and wash hands. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Um, and this goes, before I pass it over to um, Dr. Dana Long, I just wanted to talk through this because this is really the complexity that lies at the heart of our of starting slow. Um, one of the things, if you could look at it, it, it's complex for all of us. I saw some you know, comments in the chat about people that are really struggling um, with multi-generational households and having to work and have kids at home. It is incredibly complex for all of us. Um, you know, and one of the things I just wanted to say, and, and, and this kind of data comes from the state, is that while children are getting COVID-19, right, across the entire state, no children have at this point died because of COVID-19. Um, and I'm somebody that has three teenagers at home. Um, and so, and my wife and I both work in essential roles where we're out in the community and we bring that home. And we also have a um have people in our homes that have um that have medical conditions that are it's it's incredibly complex so one of the most important things that we can do um within kind of our our own procedures around coming back to school is making sure that we develop protocols that we go slowly into developing these test them over and over again, like we did with food distribution, and we learn from it. And we, and we create a safe environment for kids, and we bring a safe environment for our, um, for, for our loved ones and, and, and our employees. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Um, Dr. Dana Long, who is going to walk us a little bit more through some of the um, complexities of COVID-19 and some of the science behind it. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. So, um, and thank you for the introduction. My name is Dr. Long and I'm a pediatrician at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland. I am working with a fantastic team of pediatricians from across the Bay Area, from San Francisco and Oakland, who are very dedicated and committed to supporting everybody in this process. We want students to be safe, we want teachers to be safe, we want parents to be safe. And I have to say that I give so much congratulations and thumbs up just to the very intentional work that Oakland Unified School District is doing right now in order to ensure safety. Next slide. So I, I wanna give a brief summary of what we know so far. And our role as the pediatric consults um, to work with all of you guys is to provide the science as we know it so that we can make sure that decisions are grounded in safety for everybody. What we know so far is that children get COVID less often and become less ill than adults. And the scientific reason behind this is because there's a receptor that's in the nose of adults and people over the age of 10 that the COVID virus binds to in order to enter our bodies. And that children less than 10 simply don't have that receptor. And so they're not getting as sick as often. We know that children who become positive are getting it most likely from other adults and particularly other adults that are in their household. And that they do not seem to be the major transmitters of this virus to other children. The way that we think that children are becoming positive is from adults and not other children. I just can't stress that enough. We do think that middle school children and high school children have transmission patterns that are much more similar to adults than elementary school students. And understanding that there is international literature and there's more literature coming out of summer camps and childcare in the United States, but we are making the best decisions that we can. While we recognize that virus transmission is serious and this COVID is a serious illness, we also know that there are other silent pandemics that are going along with COVID and that we are seeing a lot of adversity and that adversity is causing anxiety and depression, um, lack of social and developmental support for a lot of our kids and their families, 
there are increased reports of domestic violence and less reporting of child abuse in homes, partly because kids are not around adults that are mandated reporters. Um, we also know that this has been really hard for families and that there's huge financial strain. Um, we're seeing a lot of food insecurity in families um, and families are just struggling every day to get by. Next slide. So the way that COVID is most likely transmitted is it's not so much on surfaces, right? We're thinking that the main ways that the virus is transmitted is from respiratory droplets, meaning that an infected person has droplets that are expelled from breathing, from talking, from singing, from shouting, and that breathing transmits the droplets about three feet. When you are talking, they can go about six feet, if you are coughing or sneezing or shouting, the droplets can go as far as about 12 to 15 feet. The way that we protect ourselves in this environment is that we wear masks, right? And those masks have to cover our nose and our mouth, maintaining social distancing of six feet, having face shield or eye protection, hand washing. And when hand washing, it's washing the hands with hand sanitizer or soap and water for 30 seconds. Um, staying home if you are sick, if you have any symptoms whatsoever, symptoms ranging from um, fever, cough, shortness of breath, runny nose, sometimes loss of the sense of smell, um, red eyes, headaches, nausea, that all staff and students at all times must wear face masks, and those masks are surgical or cloth masks. And that really for school settings, N95s are not needed unless it's a very special circumstance. Next slide. So throughout this process, um, we as pediatricians are advocating and moving forward, being willing to have office hours to talk a lot more about these details with everybody. Um, but the bottom line is what can we do now to protect our community? It's to wear a mask whenever you're outside, whenever you're in public, to maintain six feet unless it's completely unavoidable, to wash your hands, to use hand sanitizer, and honestly, to get children to start wearing a mask now to get them ready for in-person instruction. So I'm gonna pass it over um, to the school district and thank you so much. Thanks so much, Dr. Long. Um, so I'm gonna pause here for a second and let our um, Arabic translator go ahead and explain interpretation here so that we can make sure that we're meeting those families' needs. Um, Hussam? Okay, great. Um, and then I'm going to bring Dr. Sandra Aguilera, our Chief Academic Officer, back up um, so that she can get into some more details about the uh, in-person models. And just as a reminder, um, what we have been talking about are some of the options for blended learning that we are developing, should it be safe to bring students back in person. And a reminder that some prerequisites here are, first, the state has to say that it is okay for schools to reopen. And then the county has to say it is safe for schools to reopen. And then districts will be left to decide how best to reopen and bring students back for in-person instruction. So we are working on preparing those plans for when it is safe to do so. Um, right now we will be beginning in distance learning um, for a for up to four weeks um, for the start of the year, um, because that is what we have heard is um, needed right now. We wanna provide that level of clarity to our families. Um, Dr. Aguilera. Great, thank you, Salja. Uh, so we've had a chance to hear the instructional model. Uh, we've heard what the families and staff have said in survey data. Uh, and we've taken an opportunity to look at the science and safety measures that we are considering. What I'll do next is take you through the uh, phases and the um, uh, thinking that has been done by the instructional um, action group uh, to set forth um, the plan as we go more into in-person learning. Um, so what you're looking at 
is a progression starting on the left-hand side. Um, the red area is noting the strong start weeks um, in distance learning. So we've gone through what that phase would look like or what that learning would look like. As we go into the first phase of blended learning, um, it is a very limited in-person instruction. Um, what all students would receive is a check-in, check-out one, one to two times per week. Some students would receive additional in-person small group instruction based on need. And um, all of our moderate severe SDC students and our mental health enriched classes uh, would come to campus every day. Uh, there is also an additional um, plan for initial English language proficiency assessment that must be done um, uh, annually. And um, there's also a plan for our special education assessments to begin. Um, so again, this is the first phase for elementary for in-person learning. As we go into phase two, uh, there would be a priority for high need students. Uh, so again, all students um, at this time would be going through uh, groupings in uh, small groups. They would be either part of the A group, uh, B group, or C group. And there would be a rotation of once per week. Uh, some students would have additional time for in-person learning. Uh, so that means in addition to their A, B, C rotation, they would get more time. Um, and again, all mild, moderate, sorry, um, this is new. So all mild, moderate, severe STC students um, and our mental health classes um, would come to campus every, every day. Um, notice that for phase two, there would be an emphasis on eight to 10 students per class uh, with their teacher. Going into uh, blended learning phase three, we focus on rotations. Uh, so that would provide um, small groups of students in either an A or B rotation. And they would have twice um, sessions twice per week instead of uh, once per week. Some students would still have additional time that's in addition to their A or B group. Um, and our mild, moderate, mental health enriched and inclusion classes, so notice inclusion is added um, to be on campus every day. And this is um, a slight increase uh, to 12 to 15 students per class. Next slide, please. Uh, so what this um, table explains are the phases. Uh, so if you look at um, the, each set for phase one, there is a, a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So it gives you a sense of what the week would look like for uh, your child. Um, so there could be on Mondays, the check-in um, sessions uh, with students. Then we would go into small group sessions. That's the A, B, and C groups. Um, and um, yeah, sorry. So <laughs> it's the small group in-person instruction. Um, and then you have the checkouts on Friday. So your book end on Mondays and Fridays with check-ins and check-out. And there would be opportunities for certain groups to come in uh, for small group in instruction. Uh, sorry, I referred to phase two as A, B, and C. Um, so phase two, that is where we introduce um, a three-day rotation. Uh, so students are either in an A, B, or C group, and they would come once that week. Uh, but then on what you can see on Thursday is an opportunity for small group intervention. So it means that students that uh, could use more support uh, to advance their learning would come an additional day. Uh, and then there would be time on Friday for teacher for professional development and collaboration. So phase uh, three, there are two options that um, the committee organized and planned. You can see that there is one approach to do week one of the uh, month as all A's coming. So all the A group of students and for week two, um, all B group coming to school in person in small groups. Um, and uh, for the option two, um, there's a different way of looking at this uh, during the week. There could be two days for group A 
with a day in the middle Wednesday for uh, more intense cleaning and professional development, and then go into two days for group B, and then uh, vice versa for the second week. Uh, so we're providing um, different options um, to consider. Uh, next slide, please. We'll go into the secondary model now. Uh, so again, the red area we went through, that is up to the first four weeks for strong start weeks in distance learning. And then we go into uh, blended learning phase one, which is very limited in-person learning. Uh, so we have middle and high school students um, that are considered secondary students. Uh, this is providing one-to-one -one advisory check-ins on campus, so every one two or three weeks, depending on student. Uh, there's also the, the same attention to the English language proficiency assessment and special education assessments that uh, would be implemented. Uh, there is also um, this idea um, for students to go to a hub site instead of, um, as an example, if they live in uh, West Oakland going to an East Oakland school or East Oakland going to um, a West Oakland school. Um, instead of uh, the transportation needed for that, there's this idea of hub sites. Uh, for secondary in phase one, all mod sev, moderate severe SDC students and our mental health classes would be on campus every day. For phase two, there would be a prioritizing of high need students. Uh, so what you'll notice is that advisory check-ins would continue and there would be additional on-campus small group support based on student needs. Uh, so um, we focused in on a foster, unsheltered, um, the transitional grades, and then your um, first year newcomers um, and any students that have not engaged in instruction, they have not been participating. Um, that would be a focus in on that um, group of students so that way we can bring them uh, into in-person learning. And we would continue with our moderate severe STC students to mental health classes and adding mild moderate uh, students to come to campus every day. For um, phase three, there are two separate options, one for middle school and one for high school. For middle school, you'll notice an ABC rotation. Uh, one to two days per week. Our uh, mild, moderate, severe students, um, mental health and inclusion students, that's a, um, adding inclusion students uh, during this rotation would come to campus. For high school, the advisory check-ins would continue. You would bring additional high need students um, to campus for additional support. And again, um, you would continue with our mild, moderate, severe students, um, and our mental health and, and we would add in this phase inclusion students would come to the campus. Uh, so again, the recommendation is to implement mini masters where students um, are experiencing three to four classes each quarter, each mini semester, uh, instead of the same uh, workload that they have had in the past. Next slide, please. Okay, and with that, um, I would like to hand it off to Preston um, to talk through how we would go through the different phases. Great, thank you, Sandra. Um, and so, you know, one of the things in terms of these phases, um, I just want to that, that there are some real critical variables that we're going to be looking at as we um, as we consider moving into these phases. And I just wanted to highlight. Um, one of the things that I, I've seen it in the chat is that while there are have been consistent consistently about 25% of our families that are saying I want distance learning for the entire year, there are about 50% of our families that continue to say I need some in person level of instruction um, for my student and, and and for my circumstances and so these phases are really around how we will move into more um, in-person instruction as the conditions you know across both the county um, come into play within our district and so one the the six factors but there are more but these are the six primary factors we're looking at cases within schools um, what is the level of ppe available 
um, a system for system checks to make sure that staff and students are, are, are constantly checking for symptoms. Um, the physical capacity of our classrooms to see like what is the actual spaces. And um, even today we've been starting to do some walkthroughs and video footage of what classrooms could look like because every classroom is different. They have different desks, they have different sizes, they have different doors, different windows, and going through and analyzing all of those different elements the daily cleaning and sanitizing that needs to happen and a level and what is the level of transportation that's available. Um, next slide please. So this slide kind of goes through an overall readiness of where we are um, today and just kind of want to walk through this slide with everyone is that you know in phase one, we're anticipating it's about 10% of the student population. There's about 36,000 students in Oakland Unified School District. So it's about 4,000 students that would be back across the 82 schools. Um, and then phase two would bring in probably about 25% of students. And then phase three would go up to 50% of students. Right now, I'm gonna go through some of those um, some of those specific variables and just talk about like kind of what is in place for, for each of those pieces. So in school transmission, we believe that we have developed in, in, um, our protocols that are deeply aligned with Alameda County um, Public Health Department and that those protocols, whenever there is a case of in school transmission that either the cohort or the, the school, depending upon the circumstances, would move back to distance learning. So anytime we're talking about phases, know that we would be monitoring whether or not cases emerged within the school. And then the, the default, as, as, as Dr. Aguilera said earlier, is that you would go back to that distance learning. The second piece is um, personal protective equipment. And we've done an amazing job at like resourcing um, personal um, protective equipment. And we feel like we have um, the PPE in place to go back, it, even if we needed to go back 50% of students, we have the PPE in stock right now in the warehouse. We are developing currently a system of, of symptoms checks for staff across the entire district. Um, it's, it's a where every staff member would have to kind of check in to say whether or not they were um, had the symptoms or not. We plan to have that in place by the fifth. Um, we have done an analysis and, and our RAD team did an amazing job doing a facilities calculator that reviews all the characteristics within the school. Um, and we do feel like we have done an analysis where we could get cohorts of between 10 and 14 kids in particular classes across the district and we've mapped that out. Um, sanitizing, this, this has been a, a key thing in the chat, like sanitizing and cleaning. Clearly there's gonna be the ongoing um, cleaning that would happen normally within school, but there's this added level of sanitizing that we need to make sure that we're doing across all the high touch surfaces, within the classrooms, the desks. And it, initially in the first two phases, one of the things that we would be able to do would we be able to take some of our custodians that are at, at sites that would not necessarily be an in-person instruction and move them to other locations. But at the place where we move into the phase three, where we have 50% of, of students um, in classes, we would need to fill our vacancies and definitely increase our sub pool to be able to do the, the additional cleaning. Transportation is probably one of the largest um, challenges that we'll face. Um, AC Transit has already given out its guidelines around what they're planning to do through December, which means that they'll be at about 25% of capacity. Um, which we do feel would be, um, would allow us to go into phase one and phase two. But once we get to phase three, there might be additional costs for the district in terms of adding additional lines um, for students to get to schools. And some of those schools we already know are like Montera, um, Skyline, and some of our schools like um, Oakland International where students travel a significant distance to get to those, those campuses. So. Um, and then finally, the other part of that element would be the special ed transportation as well. Finally, um, there is signage and there are plans around signage to get in place for school um, that would be done um, by 8-5. So before even staff comes back, we would have all the appropriate signage up in the facilities. Um, next slide, please.
So just, you know, wanted to reiterate in terms of the personal protective equipment. Um, we immediately started purchasing um, from the day that I think that um, we went into the shelter, the initial shelter in place and went to distance learning in, in March. We put in several of our first orders, but what we have, and you can see the special ed team there that is, is doing some of the assessments right now, um, they're picking up their PPE at the district warehouse. We have adult surgical masks, face shields, children's masks, hand sanitizer, thermometers. We have the specialized PPE for nurses, um, ECE and custodial. And so all of those things, and, and we're still in discussions with our labor partners as to what would be all of the PPE we would need to provide so that, so that the staff is safe and students are safe. Um, and that is something that, that, that we're in constant dialogue and, and, and adding more and more elements. For, for example, one of the things that we just ordered today was the see-through masks, because we know for students that are learning a language or um, younger students, they do need to see the face and the mouth of, of their teacher. And so we, we put in an order for some of those things. We have things ordered that are anticipating that they'll be delivered um, prior to, the beginning of school, which are electrostatic sprayers and the cloth masks for both staff, staff and students. And you know, one of the things about electrostatic sprayers, I think a lot of people have seen these on, on a lot of commercials where they're spraying disinfectant and things like that. Um, really the, the key thing about the electrostatic sprayers is it's doing the same level of disinfecting that you could do by wiping down a surface, but it's far more efficient for our custodians, uh, our custodians to be able to get more surface and to be able to cover more parts of the building. So that's one of the reasons why we're bringing those electrostatic sprayers on board. Um, the other thing is, is that we are, so right now um, we are going to give teacher kits um, of PPE that each teacher would get a classroom set of the, of the PPE that they would need for their classrooms. We're building kits for the front office to make sure that the front office has all the supplies that they would need in order to um, open up school and registration. Um, and one of the most important things, we talk about PPE um, generally, and, and it's in the chat a lot, and it's been a part of a lot of conversation, but actually what's more critical is to train people how to use the PPE properly. Um, when we first started doing food nutrition um, and we, we purchased masks for the entire staff, a lot of people were touching the mask too frequently and they had to get familiar with utilizing the mask and how to take it on and off properly. So the first couple of weeks of the Starting Strong will include um, getting staff trained on how to properly use um, all the PPE that we're bringing into place. And by Friday, we're gonna have an internal system that will allow for school sites and departments to notify us when they're running short on critical PPE and we can deliver it directly to the school site. So that's a little bit of an update on our, our PPE and I think we're gonna open it up for some questions now. Actually, I, I just noticed one question in the chat that I, I just wanted to hit that, there is a great point that a lot of people are talking about um, with respect to really young children wearing um, masks. And one of the things that, that they're looking into is actually, there's really only two sizes of masks that are currently publicly available. One is for children, one is for adults. They are currently designing a smaller mask for kindergartners, first grade and second grade that we're looking into right now that will make it easier for younger children to wear masks. And so Preston, just to bring up some of the themes that are coming up in the chat. Um, one, I think uh, just a lot of questions around, um, and this might be for Sandra, around um, how will distance learning be better? And I know that there were some of the points that you already made in your presentation, but um, just some reassurance around that. Um, and then um, some clarity again around some of the outdoor education options that might be available. Thank you, Saja. So um, I mentioned that um, we will have a scope and sequence um, that will provide teachers guidance on um, in each of the subject areas, the specific standards that will be a focus and then how to connect the curriculum uh, to those standards. So one way of looking at it is that when we went into um, the spring 
uh, we had school sites at different areas of uh, instruction in that scope and sequence. And um, starting off the year, um, we're um, providing this information so that way um, teachers can follow that scope and sequence. Um, and it is meant to be integrated with um, online learning platforms. We also received the feedback from uh, our families and from our teachers that we had too many different uh, platforms. And so there will be uh, less platforms, but um, platforms that are able to do more um, in terms of instruction. So um, teachers don't have to weave through all the different um, learning platforms to create a full program for um, their students. Uh, in addition to that, um, we did provide uh, many opportunities for professional learning at the end of the, the year and throughout the spring. Uh, and it will be different because we're able to offer those uh, professional learning opportunities, uh, not only at the beginning of the school year, but throughout the weeks as we're launching. Uh, there are different sessions that we did for teachers like Google Classroom uh, and online learning. Um, so in conjunction with the um, scope and sequence support, uh, more uh, opportunities for uh, teachers to share best practices through Google Classroom, which started at the end of last year uh, through the use of Google Classroom, uh, we will heighten those opportunities for teachers to share. We saw some great collaboration happening across um, schools. Uh, so we're open to feedback, but that is our plan um, that we are launching so far. Awesome, thank you so much. And um, Preston, some additional questions just around um, like custodial cleaning um, schedules and what that might look like. Sure. Um, that's something that we're in the process of developing right now is the, the custodial cleaning schedules for each of these phases so that we'll know what that is gonna look like. Um, and, and essentially what, what it would look like would be, you know, at the limited, when we have a limited number of students in the building, we do feel like there will be run sheets that custodians will go through that will allow them to, to clean high touch surfaces after staff leaves, they're cleaning high touch surfaces. I think in one of the models that Sandra had talked about, there's the opportunities to do even deeper cleaning that would happen. Um, one of the key things that would be built into like their, um, their runs would be checking for, um, to, to ensure that the soap dispensers are constantly filled, to make sure that the bathrooms have been, uh, have been like the handles and things like that have been cleaned. So we're in the process of developing all that and we definitely feel we will be sharing all of that um, publicly with the community as we develop those materials. Thank you. And then also some questions that are coming up in the chat around um, support for special needs students. And I know that Sandra, you had mentioned um, a couple of these supports specifically in your presentation, but I'm wondering if we could have you or um, Jennifer Blake talk to some of those supports that'll be available during this distance learning time. Um, why don't we have Jennifer Blake, our executive director of special education, uh, come forward and explain a little bit more uh, about our special education planning. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, good evening, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, relative to special education, uh, we are planning to align with the information that you all have received this evening of having our first four weeks of instruction really be focused on that strong start. This would be a time for our special education teachers to engage with families and students to make sure that they understand each child's unique strengths, interests, goals, and needs. In addition to that, we would be beginning special education evaluations for those students who need them, ensuring baseline and diagnostic testing for um, all of our students so that we have a firm understanding of their present levels and holding IEPs when necessary. I, AB 77 also requires that each student with an IEP have a distance learning plan that clearly specifies what services would be provided during a distance learning context. So during those initial weeks of school, those were be, will be made as well. Um, from there, we are planning to bring back in, um, again, contingent upon our labor negotiations specific groups of students for whom we know that distance learning has pre presented some unique challenges, which would be our students with more intensive needs and our students who are in our counseling enriched or mental health programs. 
As it pertains to distance learning services, we are um, doing a lot of work over this summer to plan for more robust supports through special education provided in distance learning. And this would include planning for dedicated time for our special educators and related service personnel to engage and collaborate with both families and general educators to make sure that the work that is being provided is accommodated and adapted based on students' individual needs. We also will continue to have ongoing weekly seminars for our staff and for our parents that are focused specifically on the platforms and accommodation tools that are available during distance learning to make sure that our families and our students and our staff have access to those tools and have the information they need on how to best use them. So uh, we are continuing, of course, to plan um, as the new guidance comes out to make sure um, that we are adhering to both the state law and recognition of the important needs of our students with IEPs and the services that are encapsulated within them. We encourage any family who has additional questions um, to reach out at the onset of the school year and request an IEP meeting as well, which of course is the best platform through which to discuss their individual students' questions, any concerns or questions that they have. Great, thank you so much. Um, also, Sandra, some questions that are coming up around um, attendance and grading, if you could clarify what the policy is going to be around that. Yes, yeah, so for attendance, we are required uh, through AB 77 to take daily attendance. Uh, so we will be taking attendance, um, which is a change from uh, what we did in, in the spring. We did track um, participation um, and uh, that was a form of attendance, but um, this will be slightly different in that AB 77 calls for daily attendance taking in contact with um, peers or staff. Uh, so ARIES will be used to track students' attendance just as it has been used before. Uh, so families should expect that there is daily participation um, for their student and for their children. Um, the next thing is grading. Um, so we are in current discussions right now around grading. Um, we are proposing that students um, go back to um, grading, uh, that they receive letter grades, um, and that um, for any um, grades that would be assigned as not satisfactory, like a, a, an F um, or a low number uh, for elementary, because the grading system is different for elementary, there are specific interventions that would need to happen um, prior to assigning that grade. And that's what we are working through right now uh, with our um, labor partners, uh, specifically the Oakland Education Association, our teachers, um, counselors, um, and people with certificate certificated uh, credentials. Uh, so that is still pending, but that is our proposal, our recommendation right now. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then Christy, I know that you're on as well. There were a few questions earlier that came up around early childhood education and the plans there. Um, I'm wondering if you could take a couple of uh, seconds to talk about what the plans are for our um, preschoolers. Yeah, so we are looking at possibly reopening a couple of centers as a pilot to uh, offer some in-person services, and then also following the guidance from the state about what distance learning looks like for early learning. Um, there hasn't been clear guidance on that yet, but we are looking to reopen a few centers and then communicate with those families. Great, thank you so much. And are there other themes that any of the other staff members wanna lift up from the chat that they're seeing either on Zoom or um, on the YouTube live stream. Salja, there is a question about how teachers would support both students on distance learning and those in hybrid learning. Mm -hmm. Great. So I don't see Sandra's picture there. I'm, I'm happy to, oh, there she is. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't hear John's question that he said. Um, it was around how teachers um, would be supporting um, distance learning as well as um, in-person learning. Uh, so this is a, a big um, area for us to dive into with teachers. Um, I keep referring to um, what is a scope and sequence. So I um, just want to say a little bit about uh, what that looks like. It is um, a daily plan that teachers can follow uh, that provides them what to do in each of the um, 
curricular areas are each of like math, language arts. Um, so what um, we're designing right now is how to combine both uh, distance learning, uh, so internet learning and in-person learning and when to implement the, the different aspects of um, that type of learning. Uh, so as the phases come in, we have to adjust what the instruction looks like. Uh, so we do have a suggested way of doing that that we'll take to our teachers and our principals um, for feedback, but uh, we are going to have a suggested way of how to integrate um, both distance um, online learning and learning in person because it does take management of the different groups and it's um, pretty complicated. It's not just an easy thing to start um, you know, groups. And so we do have to help um, our schools to implement that type of model. It will take a lot of planning and preparation uh, to implement that model. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I know that uh, there were definitely questions around the professional development that will be available to teachers. And I know that there's um, a lot that's planned for this summer. Um, and then um, some other questions as well that um, around, uh, you know, uh, just sort of acknowledging how the, how COVID is spreading in our community, um, that it, it is really um, drastically impacting our Latinx and our African American communities in particular. I do want to acknowledge that that is true and it's definitely something that is really concerning that we are thinking about um, and wanting to make sure that our um, staff and students are safe as they are coming back to school. Um, and Preston, um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the ways in which um, we have been working to improve our safety protocols at the food distribution sites over the summer around the safety partners and what some of that work has looked like as a model for the school year. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think one of the things is, you know, this, the starting strong model um, actually is built somewhat on, on what we did in the, the food distribution. And when we started it, we knew that there was a compelling reason for us to begin distributing food to families. There's 25,026 students in OUSD that depend on free and reduced lunch. And so as the guidance um, changed from at, at the very beginning when we started, there was no guidance around wearing masks. Um, it was basically social distancing and wiping down surfaces. And so what we developed was a team of people that were safety partners that were some risk management, um, some informed by different departments that began going and observing at each of the sites. And we, we created a list of protocols and they would check for critical things like, are people wearing their masks properly? Are people maintaining social distancing? Did the surfaces get wiped down at, at every hour um, within the food distribution? And so that model of continuous improvement was really powerful for us as we developed the procedures. And so if we're starting in a distance model, for example, the symptoms check that staff will have to learn to do and, and, and to be able to, to report out their symptoms. Um, that is something that we need to build a practice around and make sure people know how to use the system. Um, and so a lot of these things can be, um, you can develop healthy systems if you're constantly asking questions, how can we get better? And we, we continually do that um, after every food service on Mondays and Thursdays. And so that is definitely a practice that we see schools and, and the community engaging in as over the course of the next school year. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I also see some questions coming up just around um, safety protocols and um, kind of what to do around um, temperature screening, um, as well as what to do if there's a positive case. Um, the county has developed a series of guidelines around what to do if there is a suspected case of COVID um, or if there is an exposure, um, how to notify people, how to contact trace, um, how to recommend um, isolation for anyone who is um, uh, exposed. Um, and so those are the protocols that we will also be following um, that were developed by the County Public Health Department. Um, and at a, like in a nutshell, essentially, it's um, if someone in that cohort was exposed to someone who is um, 
symptomatic or who um, is coming back positive that, that that entire cohort is notified um, and that they are recommended to isolate for 14 days. And so, you know, all of this to say that there will be a tremendous amount of flexibility that will be asked um, should we return to any form of in-person learning um, to know that um, just because our doors are open doesn't mean that it is um, going to be uh, consistent because we may be told to shelter in place again by the county, by the state, um, or because there, there was an exposure on campus. Um, and so a reminder for those of you who joined us late, we are starting the year in distance learning. We will be in distance learning for up to the first four weeks um, and are in negotiations now to determine what the remainder of the year should look like. So we are preparing for blended models. We are preparing for supporting our students if they are able to come back on campus um, because we know that we don't want to plan for that at the last minute. We want to have a plan for that for when it is safe to bring students back. Um, but at the same time, we're making sure that the distance learning start to the year will be stronger than um, the spring where we had to pivot very suddenly into that distance learning for the last two months of the school year. So the professional development over the summer will um, largely be focused um, for teachers around distance learning and, and making sure that we have that strong start to the year um, and that our operations work will be around preparing our physical um, campuses for when we are able to bring some students back um, and parents will have the option to choose distance learning um, for the course of the year if that is the right choice for themselves and for their families. Um, Jody, were there any other questions that you saw coming up in the chat that we need to address? Um, there is a question about, um, I think you, can, you hit most of them. There's lots of questions. And so I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the guide coming out and also how we'll follow up with um, continuing to stay in communication from now until August 10th and then afterwards. Yeah. Um, so this presentation, the video as well as the deck um, will be available on our website. The deck will be translated. So um, it will be accessible to families um, who speak languages other than English. And um, we have been sending out and will continue to send out weekly updates about how we're preparing for the new year. Um, and we will also be planning a series of office hours with our consulting physicians from UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital so that if anyone has really specific um, health and safety questions about uh, school reopening, but also about their um, children and COVID and generally and understanding how the disease works, um, you will be able to access our um, doctors during that time to get more information. Um, and if Dr. Long is still on the line, um, I see that there are a few questions that are coming up, or Lee, if you are on the line, um, questions that are coming up around the temperature screening. And um, the county guidance around temperature screening is actually that we do what they're calling a passive symptom check so that we are asking students and we're asking staff um, if they have symptoms, but we are not actively taking temperature. Um, and through so the rationale behind that, um, Dr. Dr. Atkinson, are you able to speak to the, that recommendation from the county? I am. Hi, thank you. So um, the issue with uh, the thermometers um, by which you could do a distant temperature check um, have really been um, shown to have a lot of error in them. So they will measure a normal temperature when you do an actual temperature, somebody might have a fever. So it's a false sense of security to think that a normal temperature with um, those sort of the temporal or the one that goes on the forehead thermometers. So the best way to actually get a, a temperature is requiring people to be up close. And then um, as someone said in the chat, if somebody is on medication that can change their temperature. And then the final piece is the ambient temperature. So the temperature of the air. So if it's a cold day or a hot day, or you were sitting in the car with the sun on your forehead can also affect your temperature. So that's why many places have moved away from doing temperature screenings just because they're not accurate and they give you a false sense of security. Thank you for that. Um, also just seeing in a, a message in the chat around 
when we're opening that that is based on labor negotiations. That's absolutely true. Um, so we are starting in distance and, and we are negotiating our um, all of our labor contracts right now to determine um, exactly what this full year is going to look like and are really here to just provide some level of information to families so that they can begin preparing for the start of the year. Um, so I wanna make sure that we get to some next steps as well. So Jody, could we go ahead and move on? So um, these are some of the things that are upcoming. So we have today, which is really our update for families. Um, and uh, this coming uh, in two days, uh, we're going to have a, a PSAC meeting, the Parent and Student Advisory Committee, um, and just a real appreciation for a number of members of the PSAC who participated in the action team in the last two months to create a lot of these recommendations and provide feedback to our staff. Um, it was really critical to have parents as a, as a piece of the planning team um, to help guide us in terms of what devices we were buying, what platforms we were using, what kinds of blended models we should be thinking about. Um, that was just a really critical voice and I want to appreciate them. Um, principals are coming back early, so we are providing some paid PD time for principals and their instructional leadership teams to come back early. There's a lot of new things that are going to be happening this year um, so that we want to make sure that they have enough time to wrap their mind around and begin planning for things like um, instructional minutes, which are new, and schedules, which will be new, um, as well as, uh, you know, making sure that we have that strong start to the year. <clears throat> First day of school remains August 10th. That day will be online um, and that we will have that first phase as distance learning. And that we will be doing um, the technology di distribution with Oakland Undivided over the course of those first few weeks of the school year. So a reminder for those of you um, around the technology distribution is that when we went into distance learning in the spring, we were loaning out OUSD devices, OUSD Chromebooks, um, to families. And we will continue to do that to make sure that families have access to a device, that families have access to the internet, access to distance learning. Oakland Undivided is a separate campaign that was really focused on getting to one-to-one -to -one so that every student had their own personal device that was theirs that they could keep. And so that we are making sure that every student who needs a computer um, is able to get one at the start of this year um, so that they could keep that over the course of the duration of their academic career. Um, and so that's the work that's happening around right, right now, um, waiting for the devices to arrive and making sure that they are um, allocated to the sites appropriately. So families look for a survey around your specific family's um, technology needs um, towards the beginning of the school year so that we can get that information and get those devices out to your children. Um, okay, next slide, please. Um, and then also just want to point people to um, a, a tremendous set of resources at Family Central. Um, this was a website that our family engagement team created um, in the spring, again, with sort of very little notice to make sure that families had access to the information they needed about how to support their students with at-home learning, about where to get um, food over the course of the closures, um, how to access health services, um, and that this is a website that we're continually adding to, um, that we have video resources, that we have um, websites, that we have information in multiple languages for you to access, and it will continue to be a resource where we're um, placing information for families. And uh, that's in addition to another website that we have for teachers, it's called Teacher Central, where we've been centralizing where teachers can go to get access to the resources that they need to provide high quality distance learning to their children. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, that was a lot of information. I definitely heard in the chat that that was a lot and it's making people's heads swim. So I appreciate you for sticking with us for this long. It is a really complicated situation and I know that you know that. Um, and so I, I just want to acknowledge um, how hard everyone is working as parents, as teachers, um, students in getting through this incredibly unprecedented um, situation. Um, there is more information that is just a greater level of detail that we wanted to make available to everyone in the name of transparency around curriculum development, around the office hours with our doctors, um, information from AC Transit 
who are doing physical distancing and fewer riders on their buses um, and about how we're going to continue to communicate with you over the course of um, the next few weeks specifically, but also over the course of the next year that we want to make sure that lines of communication with our families are open. Um, so again, this deck will be available online. It will be translated um, so that you all can look through this information um, at your leisure. Okay, and um, with that, it is seven o'clock. We will be taking the questions in the chat that we didn't get a chance to answer. We will be putting it in a frequently asked questions document that will be accessible on the OUSD website. So if you didn't get your question answered, um, I apologize, but look for the document um, that will be posted online. We have one already that's prepared today from some of the previous engagements. And so you'll be able to start by looking through some of those and see some of the answers to questions that didn't get asked tonight. All right, so thank you everyone. Please stay safe. Please wear a mask when you go outside. Um, and we look forward to seeing your kids back online on August 10th.